Well, welcome everybody to this worship service at Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany. A special welcome to all of you watching on YouTube. We hope it's a worshipful and enjoyable hour uh, for you as well. A special welcome to, uh, also, a thank you actually, to, to our singers and our musicians who will lead us through worship uh, on this day as well. For today's worship, we'll be using setting number three in our hymn book, a setting in which we'll also be celebrating Holy Communion. For those of you at home, you are welcome to join us. Just have some uh, bread and some wine ready for the communion uh, part of our worship service. Now please join us as we celebrate together. The Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The brief order of confession and forgiveness. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess we that we have been captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. Know that in Christ your sins are forgiven. And by God's grace, salvation is yours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join together in our gathering hymn, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray to 
and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Hi, kids. Uh, for the children's message today, I, I thought I'd, I'd pull out of my pocket something that just about everybody has these days. It's my cell phone. Now, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna ask, do you know how this works? Because you see, I don't. I'm not sure what's inside this box. I have no idea how it works. You, you, push, you push something and it turns on and, and oh, I guess you have to, uh, there, there's some security even. You have to put your thumb on it or you have to type in a, a passcode and you have to try to remember those numbers if you're going to have a passcode but once it's on you know that it's working and you can phone anywhere in the world well don't try this at home though don't try to just phone anywhere in the world without your mom and dad being there but it's a remarkable thing and well it, it works almost all the time and when it doesn't work you know something is wrong. And mostly, when this phone doesn't work, I know the battery is dead. It doesn't work unless you plug it into something to charge up the battery inside. The one thing I know about a cell phone is that it has a battery inside here somewhere, and it needs that battery charged up in order to work and to do what it's supposed to do. Now, it's kind of like us. Jesus is the one who is the thing that powers us as God's people and charges us up so that we can do what we need to do out there in the world as God's people. And the one most important thing that Jesus says we should be doing is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now that leaves that pretty wide open. How do we love our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? And all of those questions that we might ask are questions that Jesus kind of just leaves out there for us. We, we know that our neighbor is just about anybody that we run into. That's who we're supposed to love. And the thing about that is, is that every now and then, we need to be charged up like this phone. And for instance, coming to church is one way that we have always, always 
charged ourselves up for the coming week to hear God's word, to, to have holy communion, and to remember that God loves us and is with us in so many different ways. Now, we're in the middle of something called the COVID pandemic. You've probably heard all about that. And even, no matter how old you are, I'm sure that you have experienced what that means to your family. And it's, it's hard. This church is empty, and I wish that you were all here. But the church is empty because we don't have services here. So how do we come together to get charged up? Well, by doing this, by putting our worship online, to put the Word of God online. But that means that, that you too have something to do in order to get charged up. And that is to also watch with your mom and dad on those Sunday mornings when our services are on the computer, to watch, to hear, to celebrate with us because that's what worship really is. It's a celebration of Jesus being with us and Jesus rising from the tomb and Jesus instructing us so that we know what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when we hear that on a Sunday and we, we know that Jesus is with us, then we have that energy, that battery buildup to be God's people and to love all those people out there somewhere, whoever they are. So get charged up and continue to worship with us and celebrate with us. Amen. The first lesson for today comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read responsibly Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The second lesson this morning comes to us from 
1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and there, that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all from whom all are all things, and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. gospel for this fourth Sunday after Epiphany is from the Gospel of Mark, beginning at the first chapter, the 21st verse. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Now they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, for word of scripture on this day, we give you thanks and pray that you bless your word to our hearts, our minds, and spirits, that we may hear and understand. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
Well, grace and mercy to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's quite a thing. I mean, if you were sitting in synagogue at the point where Jesus enters with his disciples, I don't think that anything strange would appear to you. But then in their midst is this fellow with unclean spirits. And he confronts Jesus and tells Jesus, what do you want with us? We know who you are. You're the Holy, the Holy One of God. Now that, that I think if that happened in this, in this congregation, that would make your ears perk up. That's new. That's new, but then, but then again, when Jesus arrives on the scene, I think everything is pretty new to the people around him and the people who are listening to him and the people who are watching him. And here is someone that is a part of their community. And this person has an unclean spirit, or it sounds like perhaps more than one. Have you come to destroy us? Plural. And we could make a, a great deal about this, this miraculous thing that happens, that Jesus commands even the unclean spirits to leave the man. What a thing. He'd be written up in all the newspapers. He'd live stream it, perhaps. I don't know. And everybody would find out. And because they had word of mouth, I think word traveled a little bit more slowly. But, but we seldom give these folks credit for word of mouth. It's practiced. And I, I dare say, well, if you've ever played the game, uh, telegraph or telephone or whatever, it, you, where you sit around a table and then somebody whispers a secret into one person's ear and it goes around and by the time it gets back to that person, it bears no real resemblance to what they started with. And so we think word of mouth would go out there and this truth would be stretched and, and almost completely in disarray, eventually. But remember, these people are practiced at word of mouth because they don't. They don't have our radios, our television, our phones, our texting. They had a real need to make sure that word of mouth was accurate. And so their focus on what they hear and then what they say would be different. But if we focused simply on this, that Jesus removes unclean spirits from this fellow, we'd really miss the point. So let's move on from that entirely. Because the real point is this where they wonder, who is this? Their clue, their clue, and maybe the clue that many of them would miss comes from the evil spirits, believe it or not, from the unclean spirits. We know who you are. We know who you are. Remember that it's not at this point that Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they tell, they tell their master exactly what people are saying out there. And then Jesus turns and says, who do you say that I am? And they say, the Messiah, the Son of God. That happens later. So nobody has up yet spoken anything about who this is. Until now. Jesus has begun his ministry. He's called a few disciples. In that first chapter of Mark, things happen quickly. And here we have some unclean spirits who seem to recognize exactly who this is. What's the clue? Because like I said, if you were sitting in synagogue that day and in walks Jesus and his disciples, it's just the locals. This is Galilee. This is where they're from. There's nothing strange about that. So what is, what gives Jesus away? What is the clue? Not sure. 
But it is interesting, it is interesting that it's these unclean spirits who recognize. And then when Jesus does this miraculous thing, this deed, they wonder about Jesus' authority. And as we are in the middle of the season of Epiphany, that is what we focus on. And it's really what the story is focusing on as well. Jesus will do any number of things. By the time that we uh, arrive at this particular story in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has already done some remarkable things. So really the issue is his authority. What is this authority? And if he has authority, then what is the new teaching that comes with this authority? Because they've never seen this before. What authority is, is power. Whether the authority is placed in power or naturally assumes power or has always had it, being born with it. Kind of like the queen's kids. They were born with it. They're born into it. They have this natural authority that seems to set them aside. But if you put ragged clothes on them and set them out in the street somewhere, you would never recognize who they are. Because I'm sure right now in California, uh, what's his name and what's her name are hardly recognized. <laughs> so keep this in mind. Authority is power. Now, that's Jesus' authority here. One that with his power, he usurps the unclean spirits, pushes them out with a word. With only a word. Get out. Leave. And they have to. That's power. Power even over the unseen, and this is who Jesus is. Power in our human world is different. We assume it differently. We grab onto it differently. We use power, and so often we abuse power. It is hard for the powerful to use their power well and to remain humble and to use it with humility or to not use it for their own gain. And yet here, here is Jesus who is using his power. Now keep this in mind because Jesus' ministry moves on from here. And in the Gospel of Mark, things travel quickly. It's, it's a short gospel. And so from this point in chapter 1 to the time of the cross is really brief. And Mark uses the word, and immediately Jesus went off to this and that and the other thing. And, and things happen very quickly. But when we come to the foot of the cross, in this gospel, ask the question, why Christ doesn't use his authority to save himself? To call down the angels. To destroy that hillside with hellfire and brimstone. Not to mention the homes of all of those who put him up there. Better yet, to cause some great calamity that destroys Golgotha entirely so that this event doesn't even come near to the point of Jesus being crucified. And yet we see on the cross, there is our Lord. And if you look at this story of the man with the unclean spirits and any other story of Jesus using power in the Gospels, you will find that at no time, no, at no time does Jesus use his power for his own self-gain. Even here, the power, the authority that Jesus has that he uses is for the benefit of this one man. This solitary individual 
who is beset and abused by something of outside of himself that has come into him and oppresses him. And what oppresses this man, Jesus expels. That's Jesus' authority. Even when Jesus has finished with 40 days of fasting out in the wilderness and is approached by the devil himself, by Satan, and tempts Jesus. First temptation is what? In, in, the, gospel, <clears throat> in the Gospel of Matthew, the temptation is to turn this stone into a loaf of bread because surely if you are the Son of God, the Holy One of God, you can do this. Jesus refuses to use his authority and his power even to feed himself. And so we see our, our Christ, our Lord, the Holy One of God, nailed to a cross. Why doesn't he use his power, his authority, to save himself? It is the very question that one of the thieves that is hung with him on the crosses asks him, why don't you save yourself? And while you're at it, you know, because if you can do it for yourself, do that for us too. Because my wrists really hurt. So what is this? What is this new teaching that they, that they wonder about in this synagogue on that Sabbath? I suppose the only, the only way that John, the gospel writer, has to put it is that this is love. This is the compassionate Christ who shows the face of a loving God who is so willing to forgive, who is so willing to be with that God rips heaven open to come to be with us. Whatever that veil, that, that, that splitting device is between heaven and earth, that is pulled aside entirely. Even with angels singing over a, a, over a pasture with some shepherds. Right down to the crucifixion. God with us. That's where it happens. This is sacrificial love. Because Jesus does not use his authority and his power for himself. He uses it and sets it aside for the sake of humanity. It is for the sake of people. And here in the Gospel of Mark, he uses it for this, this solitary individual, this no name. This man has no name in the Gospel. It's just anybody. And he frees him from that which oppresses him and makes him new. And as for us, as for us, he frees us too. We're baptized into Christ and therefore with Christ. And as Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, when baptized into Christ, we are with Christ in his crucifixion, his death, and if so, then we are also with Christ. Christ in a resurrection like his. And in doing so, and being where we are, we are set free as well from everything on this planet and in the universe that separates us from God, that hinders us from being the people of God, from being the church that we are meant to be. Oh, I know a lot of our humanity can get us into trouble and get in the way, but we are there too because Christ is here. What hinders the human heart from becoming free in Christ is removed and amounts to nothing. It frees us from the spirit of our culture that can be sinful, where humanity seeks power and uses power and abuses power for its own sake. 
and for selfish gain. There, Christ's nature instructs us to follow not that voice, but to follow the voice of Christ. So that where the hungry and the poor and the vulnerable are pushed down and stepped on, the voice of Christ that says, follow me, instructs us to follow Christ into the middle of the poor and the hungry, the vulnerable, the oppressed, and to lift them up. frees us so that we, like Christ, can love freely and without, without the motive of self-gain. And so we follow. And on this day, we follow Christ to a synagogue where there is a sorely oppressed individual and we lift them up. May we as the church seek those places where we can go to lift up those who are oppressed. Amen. Let's sing together, Healer of Our Every Hill. I invite you at this time to join with me in our confession of faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and then he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we join together in the prayers of the people. I invite you to join with me. Each of the petitions will end with, now let us pray. And I'll ask for all of you to respond with, have mercy, O God. Now guided by Christ, and made known to all nations. We offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need, and for all the whole creation. We pray for all who share in the work of the gospel to proclaim Christ and the freedom we have in, in Christ. We pray for pastors, deacons, lay ministers, and all lay people, for bishops and leaders of the church and all its ministries. Now let us pray. Have mercy, O God. We pray for the whole of God's creation in thanksgiving for all that creation provides, not only for ourselves, but for all people and all creatures. We pray, too, that you encourage us in the task of being better stewards of all that you have made. Let us pray. Have, have mercy, mercy, O God. We pray for governments and leaders of countries, cities, provinces, that in their governing they may do so wisely, compassionately, for all the people, especially those most vulnerable, where they are, and keep a civil society. May all be aware of Christ's own words, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. We pray for all people in this time of COVID, thinking especially of those who are sick or dying, those who work in the hospitals everywhere, the doctors, nurses, aides, and hospital staff. We pray for researchers of vaccines, and we pray for a final end to this pandemic. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. We pray for the concerns of this congregation, for our friends absent from worship and fellowship, and for those we know who are ill, who need our prayers, who suffer either in body, in mind, or in spirit. So now, O oh God, hear the prayers of each of our hearts, even those prayers too deep for words, as we bring these before you in this quiet moment. Now let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Now we offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the covenant you have made with us in the waters of our baptism. You keep us in the life of Christ, crucified, died, and risen, to new and everlasting life. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us and in us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. We come now to time of offering, and thank you all for your gifts through this time of COVID. You can continue to give through regular mail, automated deposit, or by e-transfer, so that the work of Good Shepherd can continue. Now let us pray. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child, with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care, 
and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with the same love through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him, your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming again. Come, O Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us and awaken your people. Fill us with your light and bring the gift of peace on earth. O come, Holy Spirit. Now all praise and glory are yours. Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High God, now and forever. Amen. Now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Come, for the feast of Christ is prepared for you.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and to serve others in your name. Now, God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Spirit sends us forth to serve. Let's rise. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and to serve others in your name. Now, God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Spirit sends us forth to serve.
Now go in peace to love and serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God.